Picture the scene. It's 1991. The Berlin Wall has just fallen. The east-west divide has been demolished. A gallon of gas costs $1.12. Apple's share price is 41 cents, and Amazon was just a rainforest. Mobile phones looked like this. Music players looked like this. And someone surfed the World Wide Web for the first time in history on this. Well, it's safe to say a lot has changed since then. Now we can augment reality. Our cars drive themselves. Our homes are smart. WWW dots rule the world. And we have access to pretty much anything, anywhere, in the palm of our hands. So the question is, what could our world look like in 10, 20, even 30 years? And what are the technologies and companies that could take us there? Here at Capital.com, we like to explore complicated financial and macroeconomic topics and break them down into simple, digestible explainers. Check out our latest film on overvalued and undervalued stocks in 2023. Let's dive straight into our first sector. One that, if you believe the movies, could spell the end of humankind at the hands of an evil robot overlord. Artificial intelligence. We spoke to Sebastian Malaby, author of The Power Law, Venture Capital, and The Art of Disruption, to give us his insights on what technologies he thinks could change our world. The top one I would mention is artificial intelligence. I think that technology has reached a moment of maturation where the cutting edge science has advanced so much that you can now commercialize it, right? The fundamental work has been done. We've seen, you know, products like uh, AlphaGo, which famously defeated the, the top Go player in the world, demonstrating a machine intelligence that people didn't expect. Meta just released one an AI that could win at diplomacy, which is a game that has a component of negotiating uh, with other human beings. So that's very impressive. So far, AI hasn't spelt the end of the world. In fact, AI and its offshoots of machine learning and deep learning are shaping the future of humanity and driving innovation across every single sector. According to a report by PwC, AI is expected to contribute $15.7 trillion to the global economy by 2030. And according to a survey of 350 AI researchers, there's a 50% chance that machines could outperform humans in all tasks by the year 2060. Here's a quick list of sectors AI could revolutionize and how. In healthcare, AI can use massive data sets to more quickly and accurately diagnose and treat diseases discover new drugs, or even act as a medical assistant. Imagine a completely personalized, democratized, AI-powered healthcare experience based on your genes, environment, and lifestyle. Then we have the transportation sector. Most people's idea of the future probably contains driverless cars, robo-taxis, and autonomous delivery vehicles. AI has already started to revolutionize this space, and companies like Tesla may have grown because of this future potential. Then we get even more futuristic. Actual AI-powered robots could be working alongside real human workers in manufacturing, services, and care facilities. Any task that is physical and repetitive may be eventually replaced by an AI tool. AI naturally covers every sector. So how is it even possible to invest in something that is this big? I think one approach um, to, to trading AI, if you're restricted to public markets, is to try to figure out which of the mature companies in any given sector are adopting it the fastest, because it's gonna give them an edge. So if you take banking, for example, uh, and you, you line up the big American banks, and you say, which is, be which is best at AI? Right, On to our next market, one that could physically change the earth. Green tech. Decarbonization of the Earth and the global attempt to move towards net zero by 2050 could take an astronomical $150 trillion of investments over the next 30 years, according to a report by the Bank of America. And I think finally now, with you know, heightened concern about climate, because you can just see the evidence of all these natural disasters that are occurring 
wildfires and hurricanes and all that. You know, finally, people are taking it seriously. There's a new wave of uh, big interest in clean tech. Around 140 countries across the world have set or are considering net zero by 2050. Government policies like President Biden's latest U.S. Inflation Reduction Act include massive tax credits for green tech and could therefore offer a huge stability and growth potential. The largest sector within green tech is, of course, renewable energy. The interesting thing about clean tech is it had a full storm around 2005 to 2008. Renewables, wind power, wave power, solar power, all areas where Britain can actually lead the world. And so there was a big wave of anticipatory venture capital investment uh, into clean tech, and that either failed or it paid off on such a long time scale that it kind of failed as well. But at least there was progress in how you do solar, how you do wind, how you do uh, new kinds of battery. And so now I think industry is moving into it in a bigger way. It's paying off much better. According to the IEA, global renewable capacity is expected to increase by almost 2,400 gigawatts, or 75% in their main case forecast between 2022 and 2027. That's equal to the entire installed power capacity of China. With China providing the majority, then advanced economies like Europe and the US, followed by emerging economies like India. But it's still below the accelerated case and what's needed for net zero by 2050. This has been significantly catalyzed in 2022 as countries look for energy security following Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent global energy crisis. For investors, there are smaller cap renewable specific energy companies to explore or even big cap gas and oil giants transitioning to green tech or for diversification, ETFs that cover the whole sector. Another key decarbonizing technology is carbon capture utilization and storage, or CCUS. We've all heard about the numerous negative impacts CO2 has on the climate. Well, this is the method of capturing that harmful CO2 during the industrial process before it can do that damage. Then either transferring it via pipeline for use in other industries like gas injection enhanced oil recovery, or injecting it deep underground for permanent storage. Warren Buffett recently invested billions in oil and gas giant Occidental Petroleum, with many believing it's a long-term play as they plan to build 70 carbon capture plants by 2035. So again, investors may be looking at companies, either small cap or big oil, that may lead the way in carbon capture. Now, from green tech to biotech. One of the key industries biotech is revolutionizing is medicine. In particular, the detection, prevention, and treatment of human diseases. Now, I think we're at a really interesting moment where the whole sort of area of medical technology may be coming back, may be a new rival uh, to IT. Partly because IT has matured, so much has been done with software that maybe it'll be um, slowing down a little bit. But also because you've had these breakthrough fundamental technologies. The first one was uh, just the ability to sequence the genome. Then secondly, the ability to sequence the genome super cheaply. And then you've got gene editing, that's CRISPR-Cas. Uh, so that's a, a breakthrough. According to strategic market research, the gene editing market is expected to grow from $5 billion in 2021 to over $21 billion by 2030. And then you've got the ability to manipulate mRNA, as we've seen with the, the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines, and that could be applied to other technologies. Some believe RNA technology has the potential to revolutionize disease prevention with better vaccines for the likes of influenza, HIV, malaria, and more. And on top of that, I would add one more, which is, you know, artificial intelligence has cracked the code for uh, protein shapes. And that is revolutionary. It used to take a PhD scientist uh, four years or five years to figure out the shape of a protein so that you could design a drug that would bind on top of that shape. DeepMind, an AI company owned by Alphabet, cracked that code this year and released the AI open source tool to the world. Again, this means it may be difficult to invest directly in the technology. Investors may be looking at companies who are leading the way in the gene tech space, whether it's gene sequencing, CRISPR-Cas gene editing, RNA technology, or AI protein folding. But make sure you do your research as these companies can be volatile 
and very dependent on regulatory restrictions and breakthroughs. Okay, so there's editing humans. What about animals and plants? Humans love meat, and there are a lot of humans, eight billion as of this year. That's a lot of farming space, deforestation for crop feed and greenhouse gases. In fact, in the EU, livestock farming produces more greenhouse gases than all the cars combined. So naturally, as the world goes more green, alternatives are being found. Lab-grown meat established itself a number of years ago. Someone famously ate a lab-grown hamburger live at a conference. The burger cost some 200,000 pounds to develop and was made by using stem cells taken from a dead cow. It now costs only around $9.80, according to Forbes. Imagine a world where the same amount of meat is being produced in one big factory as a whole continent of farmed land. There are a number of publicly traded companies that investors could explore, which specialize in lab-grown meat. But be aware that Singapore is currently the only country in the world where it's legal to sell, so the addressable market is currently small. I'm not certain about the future of lab-grown meat. I tend to be a technology optimist, so I kind of think that, you know, I'll, I'll expect it probably will work at some point, um, but that's just a guess. But what I would say if we broaden the frame a tiny bit is that food tech more generally clearly uh, is making progress and the impossible foods, not impossible meat, you know, is this, this plant-based hamburger thing. And that is an unbelievable story. According to Bloomberg Intelligence, plant-based foods could be worth $162 billion by 2030. Oh, I think it's got a long way to run because, you know, creating um, a sort of facsimile of hamburgers is one thing, but then think of all the different kinds of meat that you could copy. Think of how much that could be rolled out because, I mean, it's available in some places, but I think the price point is going to come down as they scale up and the technology matures. And so I think it's going to be, you know, eaten by a lot more people in the world uh, on, a, on the next 10 or 20 years. And then also, I think once you've done that and people are used to the idea that with plants, you can make funky new kinds of food. Um, you can, you know, why stop at copying existing meat? You could invent entirely new kinds of stuff that people enjoy eating out of this technology. So I think there's a huge runway for this. Finally, of course, many investors would have been extremely happy to catch Apple early. That's a pair. Close enough. It went from a small tech startup to the biggest company on earth. So the big question is whether it's even possible to do that in today's investing climate. The bad news for public market investors is that venture capital and the world of private investing is spreading geographically into new countries, it's spreading into new sectors, uh, and it's spreading importantly along the life cycle of companies. So it used to be that a company like Amazon would get some venture capital, then if it was doing really well it would go public maybe in a couple of years uh, at a valuation of like $400 million, uh, and then public market investors could go buy it. And the venture capital people have said, wait a second, um, we think we'd rather keep those profits to ourselves. And so they've invented this thing, growth equity, where they provide follow on rounds of capital. Uh, and so the Amazons of today are not going public at $400 million market cap. They're becoming unicorns, which is where you're worth 10 billion. And then they're becoming Decca unicorns and they're staying private. So take Stripe as a you know fintech leader founded i think around 2010 or so uh, and you know 12 years later you know it hit a valuation of i think 100 billion at one point it's now probably down to 50 uh, billion but it's still private right so that's bad news uh, for public market investors thanks for watching if you enjoyed the film don't forget to give it a like and for more videos like this hit that subscribe button and keep the notification bell switched on to stay tuned see you next time